Let's talk about macros in Swift. They're a new feature and they can do some fancy things. I'd like to draw your attention to this user struct here, a very simple struct that is a name, which is a string and an age, which is an int. I then have inside of this content view, a state variable for a user. And then in the body, I'm calling this strange and mysterious form.derived method, passing in the binding to our user state. And then we're just debugging the, the user here. And we see that this gets us the following form. We see a field for our name and also a field for our age. And when we make changes, it shows up here in the debug view. The interesting thing about this is if we were to add a new field like is alive as a Boolean and then add a value for that field, I'll make myself alive. All I need to do is save and then the preview updates immediately. And now I have a new little toggle for whether or not I'm alive. I should be careful with this. Let's take this even further by making ourselves a pet friend. A pet's going to have a name and a favorite food. And it should also have this formable annotation. Now we're going to add a pet to our user and we'll also add one down here. So we're going to make Sparky who loves string cheese. And all I have to do is save and the preview is updated with a section for our pet Sparky. It is somewhat magical. We could rename our pet to Ishmael and change their favorite food to raw beef and everything updates just as before. Pretty cool. So now let's look at how we could implement this ourselves using the new macro capabilities of Swift. Okay, so to do this first, I'm going to make a new workspace. And inside of this little folder here, I'm going to make a formula macro workspace. I'll call this formula macro, put it in its own folder in here. Making workspaces strange sometimes. Okay, and here we are, there's nothing in here. So I'm going to go up to the new package. What is this command? Control, shift, N. I'm gonna click on that feller and click on Swift macro. I'm gonna make sure to put it in this folder we just made. I'll add it to this formula macros workspace and I'll call it formula. Great, so now it created this formula macro package inside of our workspace. There are a few different subfolders, a, a bunch actually. There's this client, which is to use our macro. It comes with sort of some demo code. So there's this stringify macro that takes an expression and returns a tuple of the expression and its string representation, which is something that really only a macro could do. So if we were to run this executable, we should see something like the value 42 was produced by the code A plus B, so whatever code string you've typed in here will be returned as this code string here with the actual result being here. It's a fairly nifty macro, but we don't care about this. One, we want to make the formula macro that we just looked at, the formable macro, whatever. I'm going to get rid of this client because we're going to orchestrate things a little differently. Similarly, in the package, I'm going to get rid of the executable down here as well. What you do need for every macro package is the macro definition file where we're going to have these interesting annotations like freestanding and then basically what looks like a function definition except instead of the func keyword there's the macro keyword and then instead of an actual implementation you have what looks like a macro call but actually sort of just lists a module and a type so that's going to have to actually connect to some other target here this formula macro in which case there is this type stringify macro so formula macros contains stringify macros. So we're going to do something similar. You need these two different targets. But all of this is generated automatically when you do that file new package and select macro. And you could just get rid of that executable if you'd like to. I want to run mine from an app to simulate actually using this to, you know, generate real views. So I'm going to also go up to file new project. You can't see that it's slightly off screen, but here's the new project window. And I'll do formula test app click next and i will also add this to formula macro click create and now we have this test app here as well with the content view and everything we can just get everything connected to get started so i'm going to make sure i'm in formula test app click on this scroll down to frameworks libraries and embedded content and then add formula which is our little macro package or our package that exposes a macro and now if we go back to our content view here I can import formula and I can use the stringify macro. So let me split this into the actual result calculation and the code string. And then in here I can say code equals 
result. So yeah, 1 plus 10 equals 11. And if I change the code written in here, we're going to see that whole code string changing, which is pretty cool. So now everything is hooked up. We have a file to test our macros in. We have the actual macro package itself. And we can now actually talk about the process of writing a macro instead of project setup. So when writing a macro, it's always great to have the end result in mind because a macro is nothing more than essentially rewriting your code for you at compile time. And Xcode is really nice in this regard as it has this expand macro hint. So it will take the code that you wrote and showed what the macro expands into. In other words, at compile time, what this code is essentially going to get replaced with when the macro is run, it's basically this kind of the same thing as taking this code, cutting it, and replacing it with its output. So it's really important to have this code target in mind, to think towards the syntax tree you want to generate. Ideally, the macro will remove boilerplate or can use some information to do something that would have otherwise be sort of a duplication. So clearly, the first version is better. There is some duplication here between the expression that we wrote to get its result, and then the string version of that expression. We want these to be the same. Doing this by hand would be very dull, repetitive, and error-prone, because nothing is going to really save us if we accidentally write the wrong thing, or if we go to update one of these places without updating the other. A macro will allow these to remain in sync. As we update one, well, it's going to just generate the boilerplate for us, keeping them in sync. But if you're overwhelmed by this whole process of sort of AST transformations, going from this beginning code string, essentially, to some ending code string, the middle part of this in particular is what we're going to explore today, the actual writing of the macro pipeline, that macro compiler plugin. That's a bucket of worms. It's very confusing, I think, to a lot of people. So it's always great to start at the ends often starting at the end of the chain, which is what is the boring code that you don't want to have to write manually? And then once you have a really good idea of that boring code, you can say, okay, how can I express this? How might I ideally express this code? And then you would maybe think towards something like this. Well, if I could take this expression and stringify it at compile time, then it would be in sync. That would be, that would be great. So with our automatic form macro, we want to start with the boring code that we would have written. So we're not even going to think about macros. We're going to first just write some boring code by hand, see what sucks about it, and see what we could potentially just derive from the structure of the syntax tree at compile time, i.e. write a macro for it. So let's do that before even getting into the macros. What did we have last time? Well, we had a struct of a person or a user, I forget exactly, we'll make it a person, and that person will have a name, an age, it's an int, this is alive boolean flag. It eventually had a pet, but we'll get to that later on. So let's delete this and think about how we might write ourselves a form for this. Well, the first thing we want in Swift UI is to have this little state variable. So we'll have a person just as before, kit, I'm alive. Let's also have our little debugging view. I can say string reflecting person, and wrap this in a text node. So now we can just get this little debug output. I'm also going to make this bigger. Let me throw a title font on this whole thing for now, just so we can read it without squinting. Okay, the next thing to do is probably to make some text fields. So we can do one of these. So we have our title and our text. So I'm going to have name here, bind to person.name. We're going to want the same thing for age, person.age. However, for this, we actually want to use this little number format here. So I'm going to say value age format number. That'll be a little nicer. And then for our Boolean, we want probably a toggle. So I'll say person dot is alive and the label will be a text of is alive. And there we go. And then we can wrap this whole thing in a form as well to give it that custom arrangement. And we can see, yeah, the bindings work. It's not actually the worst thing to write in Swift UI. So it was pretty good at doing this kind of thing. It looks good. And now that we've done it manually, we can start to think of all of the ways in which this is a little dull. Where's the repetition here? Well, for one thing, we've mirrored the structure of our person, except via these views, these input views. We've had to reinscribe this name name for this variable here in the title case, same with age, same with is alive. And then we've had to just bind out each property in order. We've had to make some separate decisions based on the types here, but other than that, it's all pretty straightforward. So ideally, we could do something else. In fact, we've already seen our end goal is just going to be 
form.derive and then throw in a binding here. And somehow this will generate this sort of thing at compile time. So there's enough structure here to generate the following code. So if we were to just get directly into writing our macro and try to generate all of this code exactly as it looks like here at compile time, we might find that to be a little difficult. We would have to be identifying these types and say, okay, well, if the user w wrote a Boolean here, then we're going to have to generate this kind of string, this kind of code syntax tree. And that's a lot of work, or it would be more work than is necessary. There's one intermediate step. So we had our ideal input, ideal starting syntax, and that would be this, ideal start. And then we had our boilerplate end of this. And instead of writing a macro that just goes from one to the other directly, it can also be helpful to come up with a slightly more normalized, cleaned up target state. So we had the boilerplate target, but when we look at it, we'll see that there's a lot of difference here. Each element of person is expressed in a different way. Entirely different views are chosen. In the case of an int, we need to use this separate overloaded constructor that takes a value in a format. Ideally, each of these lines could look similar. And maybe this means we can write some non-macro code to clean this up. And then instead of having our macro target this output, it can instead target some cleaned up intermediate state. And we're going to write something that allows us to do that. And it's going to allow us to write something like the following instead of text field name this thing, we're instead going to say string dot make form value or something like this name person name, and then same with int and boolean. So age is alive, age is alive. Of course, these methods do not exist yet. We'll talk about how to do that. But having this higher level target state that's written in maybe its own form of DSL or at least helper methods can really help making the actual macro going from the input to output this idealized start to this target a way shorter path. Instead of going all the way, having to generate these specialized cases, the macro can actually have a pretty simple function for generating all of these targets for each property it's basically going to do the same thing. Take the type, call make form value, title case the property name, and then project that property out of the person. So these are all the same. The macro doesn't have to really do anything to handle int differently than string, bool differently than int. This is all going to be handled by whatever this thing is. So we can figure out how the heck we're going to make this work. What does this even mean? Okay, so let's now work on our idealized target. In order to view all of these as the same kind of thing, I'm going to actually make a protocol. And I'm going to call this, for lack of a better name, Form Builder. And we're going to take this signature and put it on Form Builder. So there's going to be some kind of static function that's going to say make form value. And it's going to take a label, which is a string. That's this thing here. And for reasons we're going to look at later, that's actually going to be an optional label. And then it's going to take the binding. So this value is going to be a binding of self. And this is going to get us out of view. We'd like to write something like some view here, but we're going to see that that's not going to be possible. Let's just compile. Some cannot be the target return type of a protocol requirement. Did you mean to add an associated type? And hey, actually, this is this seems like a new fix it. At least I haven't seen it before. It actually worked out pretty well. Yeah, we want an associated type. This is just a way you have to write this kind of thing in Swift so we can make this associated type, call it content, say that's a view, and then say that this method should return content. Okay, so great. Maybe we can now get it to work for string. So let's say extension string. And now string is going to be a form builder. Now let's say static func make form value. And here I'll just say whatever text field, let's make sure that this works. Oh, yes, of course, under normal circumstances would need labels. Let me add these underscores, just to make our code a little terser down here. Okay, this version of our code has compiled, so I'm going to hit the preview button again. Let's comment out our old boilerplate target and see that, yes, we have this text field thing. So what we call make form value on string, it's basically going to call this function here, and we're going to get back this text here. But of course, we don't want that. We want to do what we did in this other version. We want a text field, and we want to use the label or an empty string, I suppose, and then the binding itself, the value. And there we go. It seems to work. Lovely. And now it's just a matter of doing the same thing with the int type and the Boolean type. So I'm going to copy this, paste it below, int, make form value for int, and then I'll say value, and then format as number. So that's exactly what we had before. 
and then do the same thing for bool. And I'm going to steal our toggle. Change this to label. Change this to value. Delete that. Format. Save. Uncomment these two lines of code. And there we go. We have the same thing again, except now everything kind of looks the same at the call site. So we've written a bit of this protocol DSL thing. So that's a bit of code in and of itself, but it has allowed us to simplify our target state into this pattern. So nothing really differs except for a few variables, the type, the label, and the property that we want to extract. And that's going to make the macro a lot simpler. So I will now delete our boilerplate target. We have our new fancy target. The final step, of course, before moving on to the macro, is to also generate this code in some way, to sort of make everything regular and repeatable. We want to also make person into a form builder, and so we can't do this with a macro yet, but let's just copy this once more, person, person, and then we can just copy this information into here. Great, except I'm going to change this from form to group. And then lastly, I can say person, uh, make form value. I'm not going to pass in a label and I'm going to pass in the person binding. And oh, and of course, in here, I need to change this to value. And with that in place, this works just as it did before. So it is in fact this code that we want our macro to generate. It is this that is perfectly derivable. If I go up here from the structure of the person itself, and we can have the macro essentially just iterate through each of the properties on the person struct. And then for each of those properties, structure them into a method call like this. Whatever the type is, dot make form value, label title case, and then value dot property name. And using the macro machinery, we can do this kind of as a form of string interpolation. It's not exactly string interpolation. It's more like abstract syntax tree interpolation, but we can do something kind of like this. And we may as well think of it as a string interpolation and do this for each of the properties and we'll get our value derived. And then lastly, as a means of calling this, we can extend form and define a static function called derived on A, which is a form builder. And we're going to accept a binding of that type. We're going to return some view. And here I can now say form of a.makeForm value with nil and the binding in here. And there are some details in here that we need to make Swift happy. So I need to say where the builder.content is the same as the forms content. And it is now happy. Unfortunately, there are a few rough edges sometimes when dealing with generics. But this all seems to work all right. So now we can scroll down to the bottom. And instead of doing this, we can just say form derived and pass in our person. And nothing should change. It is the same undead. Perfect. So if we think about writing a library for this, the support for form builders for all these basic types would be supported by the library itself. It's up to the user though, when they have their own user types, it if there weren't macros, they would have to write their own form builder extensions. And as we have seen, this is sort of boilerplate repetitive, fully derivable in theory from the structure of our struct. So it is this that we will want a macro to generate. And it is perfectly possible to do that. So now we're going to get into actually writing the macro. At the end, we're, it's going to look something like this at formable. And what this attached macro is going to write this code for us. So we just do at sign formable and the compiler will sneak in some extra code into our program. So there are a couple of things actually it's going to do. It's going to add a conformance to this protocol. And then it's also going to add a member, this static function. And it's actually going to look the code generated a little more like this, which works the same way, a little uglier perhaps, but when we finally expand our macro at the end, we're going to see it looks more like this instead. But theoretically, we are just adding this form builder support to our person and we're going to do it perfectly generically. So let's do that now. Alrighty, so let's bring up the sidebar and go into our formula package and take a look at what's already here. So there are these two files or two sub targets that we care about. There's this, which exposes the interfaces for the macros, these macro definitions, and then the actual referenced here, these external macros in this compiler plugin thing. So we have here the interface, which references an implementation in this other target stringify macro, which itself is this struct that extends a special protocol that you'll have to implement some required methods for. So here's one for the 
the stringify method that comes in. This one's a little different than what we're going to be doing. This is one of these so-called freestanding macros. So you call this with a hashtag and its very invocation will be replaced with whatever syntax is returned by the macro. The compiler will delete its invocation, replacing it with whatever syntax the macro itself produces. We're going to be using an attached macro, which is a little different, but it's generally the same idea. This is going to be that at formable annotation that we're going to put on our struct. So how do we write this? Well, we're going to make another public macro declaration. This time we're going to say formable. And this one's actually easier. This does not take any arguments. In our case, it has no configuration. And these attachment macros don't return anything. So we're not going to worry about that. We still are going to have an external macro though. And it's going to be in the same module. And we're going to call its type formable macro. And then this itself needs a couple of so-called roles. This one is freestanding. We're going to make, sorry, the stringify macro is freestanding. Ours is going to be attached. And we basically need to have a different role for every, there's sort of these orthogonal things that macros can do. So one is going to be add conformance. So this is that bit of code that's going to say extension person form builder. So that would be adding a form builder conformance to person. And then there's this member macro that we're going to use to add functions, the static func in this case, to implement the required method of the form builder protocol to this person. And when you add a member role, you're also going to have to add a name here. It's a little strange looking, but it's basically going to be the name of the function you're adding. So make form value, and it looks just like this. I can just type in anything here. It's it's not really a, a string or anything. So a little strange, but this, this works. And if we were adding multiple methods, we can separate them with commas and have multiple other member I'm adding, giving them names here. And I believe this is just a way of the, the macro system helping you to make sure that you are declaring up front what identifiers you're going to be adding, what symbols you're going to be adding, so that you don't accidentally do more in your macro than you intend to, though it's also possible to say arbitrary here. And then I guess you can just add whatever names you want. Sometimes you won't know ahead of time what methods you want to add. They might be derived or in some way guided by the actual structure of the struct or class or any sort of code that you're annotating. So you won't be able to say ahead of time. But in this case, we're sure we're just implementing this method member as required by the form builder conformance. Okay, so that's one piece of it. And now we're going to need to implement the formable macro. So we'll jump over to here and we can use this as a pattern, even though we'll be deleting the existing macro already. We want to make a public struct. We're going to call it formable macro. And we don't want to extend expression macro. That's what's required by this freestanding stringify macro. Instead, we want two conformances, one for each role. There's going to be the conformance macro, Describes a macro that can add conformances to the declaration it's attached to. And then also member macro describes a macro that can add members. And then we're going to just break this open. And now we need to add some methods here. So public, static, func, and there are two. It's all overloaded here. So providing members of, that's the member macros method. And then providing conformances of. Providing conformances of is actually going to be a little easier to implement. So let's start with this one. So I'm going to collapse the sidebar momentarily so we can take this all in. It is a lot. It's quite a wide function signature there. We're getting a few arguments. Let me break these onto multiple lines so we can see what's happening. So each of these are going to take in three arguments. In fact, it's the same. There's going to be this abstract syntax tree node. So the syntax, I'll just call it. So syntax of the attribute itself. In this case, what do we mean by attribute? That would be the at formable thing. So it's going to be some code tree, syntax tree representing this. Now we're basically never going to use this. Sometimes these can have arguments in there that you might want to, to make use of, but in this case, there's nothing. We just have sort of a, an empty body. So that's going to go unused. This declaration, however, is super important. Declaration, so this is the struct person with all of its fields inside of it etc, etc, var, age, int, and so on, and anything we have inside of our struct person. So it'll be a, a, a particular kind of tree structure that contains all of this information inside of it in some way that we can explore at compile time, and we'll be printing that out and, and looking at it a lot. Uh, and then this context thing is some kind of compilation context 
It doesn't have much, but we can use it for reporting errors and emitting fix me's or other notes. So ways of, of throwing errors, really. Diagnostics, as they're called, means of reporting diagnostics and sort of other just utilities. If I look at this context dot, uh, I can get the specific location of a, of a piece of syntax, or I can make a name if I want some name that's not been used yet. We can use all of the compiler's information to do that. So it's just some tool that is passed along to us. Great. And those same three arguments are here, so I'm not going to label them again with comments. And for each of these, I need to return different things. So for the conformance macro, and remember, this is what we're going to do to add extension person form builder. We're just basically going to return a, a piece of syntax representing this. So for each conformance you add, you return sort of a, a list of tuples. The left-hand side would be, and we want to somehow generate form builder here. And the right-hand side, well, it's this where clause syntax. So maybe you'd want to have a where clause here, but we, we don't want to do that at all. You could if you, if you wanted to, and that would be the right-hand side of that tuple. And if I build this, actually, it turns out that this is, is a correct implementation. Although it says type syntax, these syntax nodes are often expressible by string literals. So you can just write strings in here, which, you know, You've got to make sure the thing is valid. It's not going to check you. You can do something that doesn't really make any sense, and it won't be a compile time error, at least not when you're writing your macro. When you go to compile the program that's using this macro, you will get a compile time error. So writing macros is this mind-bendy, time travely like experience where the, there are now multiple layers of compilation and multiple layers of runtime. There's the compilation of this file, compilation of the macro itself. And then during the compilation of the macro client, if you will, well, that is actually the runtime of your macro. So our macro will be running. This code will be executing as the code that's using it is compiling. And then eventually there's going to be the runtime of the macro client. So whatever code used our macro, and that's going to use and actually execute for real whatever code is returned by our macro. So these multiple layers. Usually it's just compile and runtime, but now we have this sort of intermediate stage because we have this separate compilation phase for our macro. Okay, so we can keep this around and let's just get something that'll, that'll run here. So for this, we need to return basically a list of declarations. Well, one of them is eventually going to be our function, make form value, but we won't worry about that right now. We're just going to return an empty array to get a sense of what the heck's happening because a lot of weirdness is going on. We'll also need to add this formable macro to this list of providing macros of this compiler plugin that we're, we're writing, this formula plugin. So it now knows that this formable macro will have what we need. Okay, cool. So let's go back to our content view and see what happens. Can we add formable? So when I jump back to our content view in our client application, we get this weird error. We actually get two weird errors. One is that it doesn't know about this attribute formable. I don't think that's correct. We'll see in a moment. But here it says redundant conformance of person to protocol form builder, which is interesting because we only see one conformance here. But if we click on this error, good, the other one went away. I think that was a false negative there. We'll see this code. And this is what our macro generated. It's this conformance macro. The result of putting form builder there has generated this code, which is pretty neat. Of course, it makes this file not compile right now because of what we've done. One thing we could do actually at this point is move this definition into here, remove this explicit conformance, and things are actually going to work again, which is kind of cool. So not really worth it so far. All, all this macro is doing is adding a conformance for us, but it is nice to know that it is successfully adding that conformance. We can use that action expand macro and it will show us the code it added. We could also, if we wanted to have fun, jump back to our macro implementation and make some kind of nonsense code. I'm even going to have a space in here. We'll see that we get this very strange error. And now when I click on this error, we'll see that the macro has now generated this nonsense code. So the macros are, are pretty great, but it's, it's really not that different than string interpolation. They try to constrain what you do and give you some types, but when this plugin is finally run, it really is going to dump this code string essentially into your file in a particular location and then try to continue compiling as though you'd written that code string. So you have to be careful that the code strings you're generating make sense. There are other languages with other macro systems that are different and, and more powerful in certain ways. I have a lot of experience with Scala and in that macro system, your code kind of compiles as you're writing your macro, which sometimes can be annoying because you have to prove 
to the macro system that your code is going to make sense eventually. This one is a little more of a wild west. It's closer to string interpolation. And that's, that's fine too. You're just going to have to make sure, you know, that you write a lot of tests and that you, you generate sensible code. Speaking of which, form builder is the one we want here. Cool. So that's been done. Next, let us take a look at this member edition, providing members of. That was really easy because we did not need to inspect any of our inputs in any way. We knew always we're adding a form builder, conformance no matter the structure of person. However, the definition entirely depends on the structure of person. To make this a little easier, let's grab this method that we implemented by hand and we can plop it in here. So now we have an example target. Another reason why I like writing the boring boilerplate version first is that it's really helpful to have some concrete code in mind when you're writing this. All of these, these type signatures alone, these function signatures alone can be quite overwhelming and it's nice to have a simple North Star. Of, oh yes, why are we doing this again? To generate this code. And in fact, we can start off by just dropping something relatively simple in here that will work. So I'm going to make a string, throw that in here. And I'll paste this same method in here. And what I'm going to do is actually internally comment out this code, or rather I can delete it, and just put in some text, hello from macro world, and let's build this. And now we get this invalid redeclaration of make form value error, because of course our macro is generating, well, the code that we just wrote by hand. So now I can delete this version from here, and we can actually run our preview again and see something very useless. Hello from macro world. So I've just rebuilt and I'll re-expand the macro and we'll see that we get this, which, you know, fulfills the conformance. Uh, it doesn't do it much useful, but nonetheless, we've added this method to person and it compiles and it is called eventually, which is pretty great. So we've actually got a lot done already. Not a bad start. Let's jump back. So really what we need to focus on now is generating these individual views for each property. So how are we going to do this? Well, this is where this declaration is going to come in handy. But further, how do we know what's in the declaration? It's this crazy, strange type. It's this thing called a decal group syntax. And then if I dot chain things onto it, there's a whole bunch of attributes, uh, modifiers, member block attributes, members inside of member block. Maybe that's what we want. Uh, but who knows? There's a lot of stuff in there. How do we take a look at it? Well, it's it's difficult to just print it out right here. We can't just print it necessarily. There's this debug description. If I build, where does this get printed? Uh, it's probably in some pane somewhere. Let me also return this explicitly. I'm sure if I navigated all of the Xcode windows, maybe I would find something that would get me this information. But one hacky way that I found that works quite nicely is to do the following. You can string interpolate into this decal string thing, and you can do the following. You can just take this declaration called debug description and throw this in here. Now, in order for this to work, you'll also need to add this raw prefix because this isn't a normal string interpolation. It's this special decal syntax that's being expressed by a string literal. So anyway, if we interpolate the raw debug description, we'll see something really weird happened in our content view. So I'm going to click over here. Of course, it interpolated the literal string into our program, treating this, which was the output of that debug description, as Swift code, which it is not at all. It's this ASCII tree. But if you do that, it lines up nicely, and we can just go here. The error even takes us to it. We can copy it, and we can jump back, remove that, and then plop it somewhere. So maybe beneath our target, I will paste this and we can behold it. Maybe even before commenting it out, we can just take a look at it and get an idea of what we want. Sort of a hacky solution, but it's the easiest way I've found so far. So at the top level, we have this declaration, which abstractly is this uh, decal group syntax, but that's kind of a, a protocol actually. And one of its actual members is this struct decal syntax. So it follows this decal syntax protocol. But what we actually have here is a struct declaration, if you will, because this could have also been a class that we were annotating, right? If we go back to content view, we might have thrown this on a class or even a particular variable definition. It could have been a lot of things. It's some kind of declaration. So this, this method that we have to define is, is abstract. It works on any sort of declaration, but in this concrete case, it's a struct. And really, we only want this to work with a struct for now. We can genericize it, but for our example, if this thing is not a struct, we want it to fail. So how do we 
get that information. For instance, I can I can see some things like member block on this declaration, which exists here, must exist abstractly on the protocol. But struct keyword, for instance, does not exist on a declaration. Identifier even does not exist on a declaration. So if we want to view this as a struct declaration, there's this method called as, there's also one called cast. And, you know, later on, we can make this nicer, but for now, cast will work. And I can say struct decal syntax dot self. And now we have ourselves a struct decal syntax. Sorry, it's kind of going off the screen, but this is now a struct decal syntax. So if I look at this, now we have identifier and we have struct keyword. So that is a, is a useful method. And now we can actually start working with this. And we're going to be using methods like cast, which force casts it to this type and throws it otherwise. But then there's also as, which would return an option of this. And that's probably what we're going to use a lot more in a moment. But for now, at the beginning, we'll just cast. And if you use this on the wrong type, so help you God. So now let's actually see what's useful in here. So we have an instance of this type, and these are all basically methods or values on that type that we can access. So let's see what's useful. Remember, we need basically the following pieces of syntax for each member. We need string, name, well, really just string and name. We can derive this title cased version from the property name. So we need the type and the identifier for each of the variables. So where do these exist? Well, attributes, I don't really care about that. That's that formable attribute that we added. So that's on here as well. So we're going to ignore that. Uh, the struct identifier. We don't need the, the literal piece of syntax that says struct. So that's what that would be. It's kind of interesting. The syntax tree, it's, it's lower level than other abstract syntax trees. In other languages, if you have ever worked with any of those, it, it has a lot of lexical information. So it, it has a, a, a node here representing this, which doesn't really give us much useful information. But if you wanted to know exactly the position of this keyword in the source code, that is exposed here. So it is actually a little more low level and, and there could be uses for that. But we're going to see that there's some nice things about low level syntax and some things that are kind of missing and a little harder than they should be otherwise or ideally would be. So some of these things we could just ignore is the point. So I'm going to throw away that struct keyword. The identifier person. Well, that's great. But in this case, we don't really care. We never use the word person anywhere. We could and, and change the implementation to use that as a label, but I kind of like the overall form to not have that label. So I'm going to remove that. Uh, inside the member block. Well, that's everything inside of those braces. We even have the left and right brace. So after person, so it was a struct keyword, then the identifier, then an opening brace. So it very much mirrors sort of the lexical shape of your program. So we don't care about that opening left brace. We care about all the members, though, things like var, name, string. And we can see, in fact, that that's in here. So for each member, so members is an array, we have multiple members, 0, 1, 2, right? We have our 0 indexed array of members. And we have name, string, age, int, is a live boolean. So they're all here. So that members block dot members is what we want. So let's explore that a little bit. So I'm going to say struct decal dot member block dot members. And maybe I'll say for member in. And we have this member decal syntax dot element. And yeah, for each of those, there's a, a decal that makes sense. So I can hit decal here. And then to get the name, it looks like we have to go to bindings. So apparently there might be multiple bindings. Perhaps that is for one thing you're allowed to write is tuple destructuring. So name, age. Theoretically, we could do something like that. So this syntax tree mirrors that very much. So that would be annoying if our user did that. But let's not worry about that for now. In our case, let's pretend we only care about the first binding. So let's get bindings. Oh, no, we can't even get bindings, actually. What does it think decal is? Well, decal is this thing called decal syntax. And it turns out that we know it's in fact a variable decal syntax. So this is where we're going to start using not cast any longer, but as. Because maybe the user has defined other things in here, like functions inside of your user or other, other things that are not variable declarations. And we just don't care about those. So let's get ourselves a guard statement. So guard let binding equals member.decal, then we'll use as and say, well, we want this to be a variable decal syntax dot self. Cool. And now the binding is that. And we can grab 
or rather that's the decal, apologies. So now we can grab its bindings, which is a list and we want the first one actually. So let me turn this on to one. So maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. We'll get bindings.first, that will be the binding. And then we want the pattern dot identifier. Oh no, identifier does not exist because this pattern is once again pattern syntax, not identifier pattern syntax. So identifier pattern syntax dot self dot identifier will get us the identifier. So a lot of as is, a lot of chaining, a nested structure, not the easiest to work with, but just consulting this tree along with using autocomplete will get you most of the way there. So we have the identifier. We also want the type annotation. So let type equals binding dot type annotation, which may or may not be there dot. Oh no, once more, when we do dot type, it gets us type syntax, which does not have an identifier. It has an ID, but that's a totally different thing. That's going to be a number. We want the simple type identifier syntax. So once again, as simple type identifier syntax dot self. Now we have name. Voila, beautiful, or not beautiful, <laughs> but it works. Then we can say else. In fact, I'm going to do something in here. I'm going to say let member views equals this, and I'll, I will map over this instead. So I'm going to have every member in here, and I'm going to do actually a compact map. So we'll just get rid of all those members we don't care about by returning nil, and then we'll return something useful equivalent to this. And in fact, maybe we can try our hand at that already. So what was this going to be? Well, the first is type, which we have right here. Throw that in there. Dot make form value. And then eventually we want this to be title case. But for now, we'll just interpolate the identifier. So then we're going to say value dot. And once again, the identifier. Let's see what we get here. Ah, I needed to add one more question mark in there. And I'm also going to add this type description of a list of strings. So we want a list of strings at the end. And hopefully, this works. I mean, it's really ugly looking code, but we need to deal with all of this optionality and all of this casting. Guard let syntax helps us out a bit. It's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but hey, we're writing macros. This is sort of low level stuff. Um, and at this point, I'm just going to get rid of this. Uh, there we go. A little cleaner now. Let's get rid of everything and, and see where we are. So what have we done? Well, first of all, we had hello from macro world, but now we want to just have each of these in our programs, so we have this array of strings. So what I'm going to do is interpolate this raw once again, member views dot joined with a separator of a new line. And I forgot a closing paren there. And now the build succeeded. So let's go back to our content view, regenerate our preview. And now there it is. And here's the same thing we started with. It's all done. It, it works. I can make myself really old and consequently deceased. So that's now off the screen. But yeah, that's pretty pretty sweet. If we expand our macro, there we go. We have the method that we just generated in our member role. And then we have the conformance generated as well. And those two are obviously intricately related. And currently we're using the value here and just dot chaining. So really, it is just really fancy compile time string interpolation with some structure given to the syntax tree that you're you're passed in. So yeah, it's this it's this weird mix of, of hackery and a little bit of uh, structure. But it, it is more laissez-faire than other macro systems out there. I guess it's a it's a wide gamut as far as macro systems go. It's probably better than C and C++. I haven't used those macro systems. But yeah, Scala is a little more, I want to say powerful, but a little uh, more type safe and maybe restrictive as well. Here you can just do anything you want, which actually makes the definition quite terse compared to something that you would do in a, in a language with more safeguards in place. So definitely have a lot of testing here. You know, we could easily generate things that don't make sense, but this works out all right. We did it. We completed writing the macro. This is a brief moment of reflection and celebration before continuing on to exploring some issues, debugging, and extraneous details. But first, high five yourself and high five the computer screen. Grease it up a little bit. Now let's continue. Now, one thing to note is the following. Like, one of the limitations of this style of almost just results from Alexa rather than a more structured abstract syntax tree with more information on it is say we wrote our code as this, which is perfectly valid in Swift. We have a default value for our age and there is no type description, which makes sense. The compiler can infer that. What will happen here is notice it went away. When we do this, it works, comes back. If I set a default value now, it will still work. But if I only have a default value for any of these, 
it suddenly disappears from our form. If we expand the macro, we'll see that that's missing. Why is that? Well, if we go back to the macro, we'll see that we were getting this optional type annotation from our syntax tree. Well, that's only there if there's literally a type annotation in the code. So one current limitation of, of these, this macro system is that it's not easy to access all of the information that the compiler has at that point. Theoretically, because this macro runs after type checking, it should be possible to ask the compiler, hey, what's, what's the type of this age symbol on person? And then get that. Currently, however, we would have to write a whole other piece of code that would inspect not the type description, but the body of the type description and realize that, oh, it's an, it's an int literal and therefore it's an int. I hope that functionality is added to the macro system eventually to, to access more compile time information so you don't have to do crazy sort of almost string parsing at that point. Overall, the, the macro system currently has a string interpolation, stringly typed vibe to it, but it's very powerful and it's very cool. And the fact that it's integrated into the editor in this way where you can expand macros, that's amazingly cool and hopefully makes macros a lot more accessible to more people because it can be a very confusing concept. But I think this makes it clear that a macro really just changes your source file conceptually in some way. It's almost like string programming. You get in your input program and you output the program that it's going to be replaced with. So that's about it. Let me know if you'd like me to explore anything else. Not sure how useful this macro is in general. It's probably good if you have some internal views you want to make if you're building an app for just yourself and you just want to write some forms. Oh, one thing I should do is make that pet our name string of our favorite food string. We need to throw a formable on this one as well. Then we can give a pet to our user. Pet, 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 Jimmy Fallon, I guess. I don't know. Another TV host. So I'm glad I tried to do that because it turns out there's an error here that we didn't see with person, but see if you can spot it. Mm -hmm. Ha! Inside of the formable for pet, we're still saying binding of person, which just does not make any sense. We need this to say pet here. I threw away too much information. I said we did not need the identifier. We totally do. Yeah, we need the name of the struct. And that goes right here. I completely overlooked that. Luckily, pretty easy to get this back. It's the struct decals dot identifier. And that should get things moving again. So let's take a look at our little Jimmy Fallon wielding person. And there it is, Jimmy Fallon with blood. Great, delicious diet blood. And a couple of more addendums now that we got it to work. First of all, our form builder stuff is all in our client or in our little example app. That doesn't really make any sense. If we're exposing formable, all of that stuff should live in our package. So we can go down here to formula and toss it in here. This is a perfect place for it. Maybe another file would be better, but let's put it all in here. And because it's now in another package, we'll have to make everything public that needs to be public. Forget exactly what needs to go where, we'll see what happens. I'll throw some publics around and we'll see what it cannot find in a moment. Of course, it cannot find form. I need to import Swift UI. So unfortunately, this initializer is only available on Mac OS 12 or newer. So I'm going to go to our package here and, you know, make it all even throw it the newest version in here. And now finally, it is happy once more and we can return to our content view and things are looking good. Once again, important to realize that we had all of this code, this make form value stuff. This was all in our client application and the formula macro didn't know about it at all, but because it's just outputting code strings and those code strings are going to be reevaluated in the context they're pasted into, it didn't really matter. But if we're going to be making a library, it's probably sensible to export all of the data types that our macros are going to operate on. And we can actually take further advantage of this. I pointed out this one case before where if we do not have a type description, our macro will sort of blot those values out. Uh, I have to regenerate this to see it. It's not update live, unfortunately. So now name is found, but age is not found. And that was because we need the type description to sort of call this static function on. However, we can think back to what we did at the very beginning, which was rework our boilerplate target code into something more general. We picked a new target that was easier to generate. Uh, and we can take our problem here and think if there's another way we can write this code. Now, Swift is smart enough that it knows that this is a binding of, well, string, and that this is a binding of Boolean, and this is a binding of pet. So it is smart enough to know these types, and it can infer these types. 
Something we can do is make a top level helper method and we're gonna move this into formula in a moment, but let's try it here first and we can call it make form value as well because it's going to be in a different namespace. And I will have this take type A, which has to be a form builder. We still need to have a form builder for this type and we can take the same arguments, label, which is an option of string, and then the binding, which is going to be a binding of A. Let me shift this over, and we want this to return some view. We might have to change that. Let's see what we have. And internally, we can just say a.makeFormValue and call this method we were calling before, binding. Let me build and see what we get. And yeah, this seems to work. So the idea is going to be that we have this other method that can infer the type from the binding we pass, so we won't actually need to generate code that references the types. We can get rid of that bit, allow the type to be inferred at its eventual call site by the value we pass in. That probably sounds a little crazy, but let's just take a look. So I'm gonna copy this method and put it in here as well, where it belongs. And if we were actually turning this into a real library, we can give this some crazy name or put it in some sort of nested enum or something as a static function just to get it out of the, the namespace. But let's keep it like this for now, noting that it is a different method than the make form value on the form builder. And now I'm going to go into formula macro and instead of calling this on the type, we're just gonna call it at the top level. And it should still work because this top level method is going to be able to infer the type of form builder, this that secret A there, based on the binding we put in. So it's going to be this now. So now we don't need to worry about type at all. So failing to find a type annotation will not short circuit our guard expression here, our guard clause. And let's rebuild and hope everything is good. And I was slightly foolish working through this in real time. It turns out when we do finally insert this this code here, this macro code, well because we're inside of person, and person is a form builder, it's going to find the version that we're defining. It's gonna recurse and call the same method. So that's not gonna work. So we do have to give this a different name, which is probably more sensible anyway, and because I'm not very clever right now, I'm just gonna make this say, make value, why not? Not the best name. Let's try this once more. And of course, this has to be public as well, all of these little details. I'm glad I'm going through these mistakes, and they are mistakes. I'm live coding this, but uh, maybe it's helpful. Also, now we're missing the labels because I didn't prefix these with underscores, which I'll do just for simplicity's sake. And now, finally, things will work, and our age exists. So we don't even have to have type descriptions if it can be inferred, which is pretty great. Uh, it's definitely weird if one is consuming this macro and you find that, hey, I can't leave off type descriptions. I can't just write normal Swift code. And when using the, the macros that Apple itself has written, you will find interesting situations and bugs. that You won't be able to write code exactly as you would normally due to problems like this. When using the at model macro from Swift data, for instance, you will be unable, or at least I was unable in, in this first beta, to, to do something like this, which is possible in normal Swift code. It's possible in this macro to use dot init here, which is shorthand for pet dot init. And this totally compiles because there's enough context for the compiler to know that this is a pet. So therefore we're calling this dot init on pet. It's, it's clever like that. However, this model macro that Swift data exposes will take this bit of code as a default value and just transpose it into some other, you know, method call it's making. It, it puts it into this sort of array of values and it's just going to basically copy paste what you wrote here into this new location. However, in its new location, there is no type information. So the compiler doesn't know what the heck dot and it is. So you get a very weird error if you try to do something like this. So it's 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 interesting. Macros are new. I, I wonder if this these usability issues are going to be addressed. You can see it's it's a little weird and you have to think differently. But all told, it's it's really fun writing macros and you could do really powerful things. For instance, something like this. And it takes a while to build an intuition for how you should how you should write these things and, and the easiest ways of thinking about them. I highly recommend the process I've outlined here, which is understand your target code, that final bit of code you want to write, and, and don't be afraid to make protocols, make a special DSL, make helper methods, do everything you can to make that target as readable and as simple as possible so that the macro you eventually write can be as simple as it can be. Because this is where it gets a little tricky to think about stuff. And this really isn't much macro code at all. As one final, final, final thing, if you remember in my original example, this nested pet had a little label and we do not have that here. And that is because, well, we can just see it. 
if I expand this macro here, the makeform value that we're synthesizing ignores its label. It never uses it. However, in some cases, if it is not nil, we want to use it to, instead of generating a group here, generate a section type, but only if there is a label. So how can we do this? Well, we can make another little helper. We can make a little view called, I don't know, section or group. We can be very silly about this. This is a view of our body, some view. We need a label, which is an option of string, and we need some content, which is going to be, well, a content, which is a view. And we can say, if let label, we will make a section, putting the label here, throwing the content in here, and otherwise we'll do the group and put our content in here. And we'll make this public as well, public, public. So that seems to be compiling. And then over here in formula macros, we can use our new section or group thing, passing along the label in order to write it in this trailing closure, which would be super nice. We'll have to go back to our initializer and make this a view builder. And hopefully this all works now. Let's take a look back at our content view. And hey, there we have our, our pet. It looks a little ugly to my eye. One last thing I forgot is here at our top level constructor, our derived constructor that wraps everything. We can say form style dot grouped. And now the pet gets its own little box for its fields. So now it looks just as it did before. Okay, that's the final addendum, I think. I can keep chaining on addendums forever, but I think this video is probably long and sprawling enough. Hopefully something here was interesting. The last, last thing I wanted to just reinforce is that the reason why it's so important to make things like this public is that this is the code that's going to get written. Unfortunately, you can't have your code generate private structs or private methods internal to your library because it's eventually going to be just like the user wrote this code. Whatever code your macro generates needs to be callable as if I, I should always be able to copy paste the generated output and remove the macro. And if that doesn't compile, it's a bad time. So you have to make sure everything in here is, is public, which is a bit of a naming challenge. You don't want to pollute the autocomplete space with a whole bunch of noise. I could probably rename some things, try to prefix some things with underscores, nest them in weird structs to sort of take them out of the way, put them behind a bunch of qualifiers, and really just expose what we want our users to call, which would be mostly this form.derived method. This should really be the only thing a user is ever calling, along with, of course, the at formable ascription there, annotation. And now I have fully exhausted my word salad chef of a brain. Have a wonderful evening.